the final in the Time Spiral block, Future Sight came out on May 4, 2007, and brought with it 180 cards. Whereas the block's first set, Time Spiral, was based on the past and the second set, Planar Chaos, was based on the present, albeit an alternate present, Future Sight, as the name might suggest, was themed around the future, including some looks at cards, card types, and card frames that may be, at some point, part of the game's future. We'll get to more about that in just a bit. As for the story, it can be experienced by reading the Future Sight novel by Scott Magoe and John Delaney. It picks up just as the previous novel is ending. Summary, please. Make it so. On the beaches of Madeira, the planeswalker Lashrak is approached by the Myojin of Night's Reach, a powerful spirit from the plane of Kamigawa. Ever since the planeswalker, Nicol Bolas, was released from his ethereal prison shortly before the rift above Shiv was closed, the draconic planeswalker has been on a revenge tour of the multiverse, settling debts he feels are owed to him. As one of those debts to him, she finds herself on the run. Looking to end Bolas's vendetta, she offers Lashrak a powerful artifact, her porcelain mask that can drain black mana from others, and asks for nothing in return in hopes that his own ambitions will accomplish her goal. Lashrak accepts. Elsewhere on Dominaria, the planeswalker Jessica is questioning Vincer, Jora, and Teferi as to the whereabouts of her mentor, the silver golem planeswalker, Karn, as well as the overall state of things. Their group informs her of the various temporal rifts threatening not just Dominaria, but the multiverse as a whole, but that four of the rifts, the ones over Shiv, Talaria, Urborg, and Sky Shroud, have been dealt with. Unsatisfied that four more rifts, the ones above Zalfir, Yavamaya, Madara, and Oteria, still remain, Jessica decides to look into things for herself and departs, bound for the island nation of Oteria. Once there, she encounters Lashrak. The Night Stalker Planeswalker says that he has been watching Teferi and his companions from the shadows and that, while they've succeeded in closing a few of the rifts, the ones that remain have been growing more violent in the process. He suggests to her that she use both Venser and Radha's unrealized sparks to channel mana into and close the remaining rifts, seeing as, as far as he could tell, their sparks are immune to the rifts' mana-stealing nature. Justifiably untrusting of Lashrak, she refuses but decides nevertheless to travel to Keld to see Rada for herself. The Keldon Warlord, however, rejects Jessica's request for proof and, seeing no other alternative, enters into a duel with the Half-Elf, striking her down and taking her unconscious body with her as she departs. Teferi, Joira, and Venser, meanwhile, decide to travel to the ancient forest of Yavamaya to seek the aid of its protector, the Morrow Sorcerer Multani. Upon their arrival, they find Multani in a vegetative state, having tried and failed to merge and consume the rift above his forest. Despite his inability to speak, he tries to communicate his need for assistance. Using his ambulator, Vincer teleports directly into the rift and is able to separate Multani from the rift's influence, returning the Morrow Sorcerer's full facilities back to him. Their audience together, however, is short-lived, as Teferi senses that Jessica may be trying to pull something in his native Zolfir. At the mage's request, Venser brings the trio to the Zolfir and Rift, whereupon they view Jessica using Rada as a buffer against it. Despite Teferi and Joira's pleas for her to stop and reassess, Jessica was too far in to stop now. The Partic Planeswalker succeeds in sealing the Rift, but the experience leaves Rada on death's doorstep. Jessica taunts Teferi, pointing out that she was able to seal the rift above Zalfir without sacrifice, unlike he with the Shivan rift. Teferi, in anger, retorts, informing her in not-so-kind words that, as a result of her actions, Zalfir can no longer be properly phased back into being, and that the civilization and millions of lives that made up the kingdom are now lost. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Jiska tries to show remorse, but claims that her actions were for the best, despite Teferi's complaints. She and the newly enfeebled Rada then travel to Yavamaya to continue her work there. Teferi, Venser, and Joira follow. Back in Yavamaya, we find Multani trying to restrain a hot-headed Jessica. The Maro Sorcerer tries to calm her mind, 
but dark influences from the Shrek cause him to fail, and Jessica goes aflame with rage. She attacks Multani with full force, obliterating the Maro Sorcerer, leaving only his ancient wooden mask, which falls to the ground. The enraged Planeswalker picks it up and aims it at the rift above, with Rada only recently having regained consciousness, once again acting as a buffer between the rift and her. Using Multani's mask as a lens, she focuses intense mana into the rift above. Much like at the Zolfir site, the rift is sealed and Rada once again falls unconscious, much worse for wear than before. Jessica drops the mask, picks up Rada, then ventures to Madara to repeat the process there. The fairy's group, meanwhile, had arrived at Yavamaya just in time to witness Jessica's actions. Joyra takes Multani's discarded mask and buries it in the soil with the hopes that the Maro Sorcerer can be born again. The group then resolves that they will do everything they can to catch up to Jessica and reason with her. In Madara, Jessica appears with Rada in tow. Before the Planeswalker can begin work on the rift there, however, the Shrak appears. The Night Stalker Planeswalker confesses that he has been influencing her actions since before they first spoke. He then paralyzes her. Lashrak then utilizes the mass the Miojin gave him to sap out the black mana that still resides within her from her pre-Planeswalker days when she was the Cabalist, Phage, explaining that he intends to use her darkness to help him defeat and subsequently absorb the power of Nicol Bolas. Teferi and friends arrive about this time, but can do a little bit wash Lashrak in action. The Night Stalker Planeswalker then calls out to Bolas, beckoning the Draconic Planeswalker to return to Madara to duel. Bolas agrees. The battle was intense, and Lashrak was proving to have the upper hand. He had Bolas trapped between the Talon Gates, negating the Dragon's Planeswalker powers, and allowing him to use the Porcelain Mask to rot away the Dragon's body. Bolas now drastically weakened and mortally wounded, Lashrak prepared one final spell to end the Draconic Planeswalker once and for all. Not even a moment before his ultimate demise, however, Bolas swung the skeletal remains of his tail, impaling Lashrak. The dragon then reveals that he had succeeded in defeating the Miogen of Night's Reach and was in possession of her original porcelain mask. Lashrak's mask, as it turns out, was merely an inferior copy. Using the real mask's powers, Bolas regenerated himself before capturing Lashrak within it. Mere minutes later, Bolas uses the power of the mask and the essence of Lashrak it contains, Planeswalker Spark and all, to close the rift above Madara, thus ending Lashrak Nightwalker's existence. Sensing that, despite the closing of Dominaria's time rifts, the multiverse was still doomed, Bolas planeswalked to a new realm to focus on his own preservation. Jessica, now finally back in her right mind, greatly apologizes for her recent actions and takes personal responsibility for the final remaining rift above Oteria, which was formed by her transformation into, and back from, being the false god Corona. Vincer, and a very forgiving Rada, agree to assist her. The three teleport directly into the violent rift where Jessica found herself facing an image of Corona. Drawing upon the power of her allies, she changed the image of the false goddess and shattered it allowing the Planeswalker to spread her essence across the rift and beyond, across the plains, and forever changing the nature of the Planeswalker spark. The next thing Jessica saw was a white void, populated only by her and her late, loving brother, Kamal. The two siblings finally united in death, Jessica happily embraced Oblivion, knowing she will forever be in his company back on Dominaria, an era known as the Great Mending has begun. Their work done, the group disbands. Rada returns to Keld and resumes her duty as warlord. Teferi returns to the continent of Jamura to help its people rebuild. Joira asks Vincer if she could borrow his ambulator so that she can seek out Joda, a person for whom she feels quite strongly for. As for Vincer, the experience within the Otaran Rift had changed him, for he was now not just a planeswalker, his spark having been awakened, but one of a new breed of planeswalker. He makes his first natural planeswalk, 
and ventures into the unknown. Thus ends the story of the Time Spiral Block and, really, marks a major change in Magic the Gathering from here on out, both card and story-wise, now that Planeswalkers were no longer nearly omnipotent beings with a quasi-immortal, godlike status. In fact, this change in the nature of Planeswalkers was actually planned to be shown in card form. So, knowing that these new kinds of Planeswalkers were coming around, and that the creative team had been looking, just desperately looking for any sort of through line that we could create between one world and another, um, and in essence build some heroes that could last, but a new card type had not been created since forever, and it seemed like that's just impossible, we, we can't even do it, but because Future Sight was the, the, the um, next order of business where anything was supposedly possible, it seemed like the right time to take a stab. Only it wasn't meant to be. Simply put, this new card type just wasn't ready yet. So they delayed the debut of Planeswalker cards for a soon-to-be-released Future Set, which allowed Wizards to put back in a neat card that they had taken out to make room for these Planeswalker cards. Because I made time to pretty early on in the process. But in, in the middle of that, Matt Cravada came to me with the idea of doing Planeswalkers. We tried to do them in Future Side. We were close enough that we knew we had something really cool, but not close enough that we were confident in putting them in. And it's funny, literally Tarmoglyph was made because I thought it was hilarious to have reminder text to show you other cards. Um, and then, once we figured out that we weren't going to do Planeswalkers, it's like, oh, this is awesome, I can show you a card that, in fact, is going to exist in the near future. And part of this was because Future Sight was a future-looking set. The nature of Planeswalkers has been changed. Therefore, Planeswalkers will be very different going forward. But Planeswalkers were not the only future-looking thing being exhibited in Future Sight. Truly, it was a glimpse into not just THE future, but also POSSIBLE futures, both story-wise and gameplay-wise. A lot of what we did is uh, riffing. Like, a lot of the future we showed you were things that were things that made sense that we could do you know a lot of it was like oh i hope they one day do this and we, we we did some of that so we tried to show you some stuff you'd never seen before we had mechanics you'd never seen before but at the same time we also wanted to go down some avenues and explore some things that was kind of obvious maybe we could do one day and show what we did there's a lot of uh, extra extrapolate of the design as such there was a lot of new and unique things that made their debut in the set Partially due to this, Future Sight introduced not just a few, but a whopping 16 new keyword mechanics. And that was in addition to the eight or so existing ones such as Scry, Transmute, and Cycling that were also in the set. Three of those 16 were abilities that had already existed, yet never had an official name. Lifelink, Reach, and Shroud. As for those remaining 13? Absorb which prevents a specific number of damage that would be dealt. Death Touch, which says whenever a creature deals damage to another creature, destroy the latter. This ability is now evergreen. Delve, which allows you to remove cards from your graveyard to assist in paying for spells. Fate Seal, which is an extrapolation of the scry ability. Fortify, which is kind of like equipment for lands. Frenzy, which grants an offensive boost to an unblocked creature. Grandeur, which provides additional functionality for legendary creatures that have the ability by providing an effect directly from one's hand. Gravestorm, which is kind of like OG Storm, but only counts when things go to the graveyard. Poisonous, which riffs on a concept that has long been within the game and gives a player hit by a poisonous creature poison counters in combat. Aura Swap, an activated ability that lets you exchange it with an Aura card in your hand. Transfigure, an evolved version of Transmute from the original Ravnica block that turns a creature in play into one from your deck with the same converted mana cost. Tribal, a card supertype in which non-creature cards can be denoted by a creature-based subtype. And Type Cycling, which is an evolution on the land-based cycling introduced in Scourge, but expanded for other types. In this case, specifically Slivers and Wizards. By the way, the design team made way more than the 16 mechanics that actually made the set. How many to be exact? Design turned over 51, 
But think about that. You know, I mean, for people that want to sort of say, oh, you know, future say it's not, it's not that complicated. No, baloney, baloney, baloney. It's insanely, insanely, insanely complicated. Adding to that complexity is a cool dozen cycles. While we won't go over all of them here, there are a few worth pointing out. There is the cycle of legendary creatures, all of which have the grandeur ability, and are also descendants from prominent legendary creatures from Dominaria's past, such as Horlash, heir to Blackblade, being descended from Dacon Blackblade. Pacts, which are rare instant spells that one can cast for free, but must pay a cost during their next upkeep, unless, that is, they want to forfeit the game. Future shifted dual lands of varying themes, all of which tap for two colors of allied mana, as well as have some other, at the time, yet unexplored extra facet to them, and textless vanilla creatures. These are notable mainly because of their striking appearance with a card frame that could, at some point in the future, actually be. One of the things, by the way, people always ask me, go, that was awesome, can you do more full-out vanillas? I, I agree, I like the idea. Um, I believe it's, it's, we will do full-out vanillas at some point. I mean, I, I, it seems too obviously and too good not for us to revisit. Though you'd probably be shocked to know... Was that sarcasm? ...that none of these neat-looking vanilla creatures got much traction on the tournament scene. Of course, a good selection of others sure as heck did, such as Bridge From Below, a strong card that, in 2019, was banned in modern due to its tendency to create an insane amount of zombie creature tokens with very little effort. Grove of the Burn Willows, which combos quite well with the burn spell Punishing Fire. Nacromoba, a popular inclusion in graveyard-focused strategies. Magus of the Moon, part of Future Sight's Maga Cycles and, quite literally, a blood moon with legs. Sacramite Mirror, the first ever colored artifact, something that would become commonplace a number of years later in the Olara block. Sword of the Meek, a car that was heavily discounted at first, but then became briefly banned due to abuse with the Olara Reborn card Thopter Foundry. Tombstalker, a 6-6 that can be cast for just two black, as long as you have six cards to exile from your graveyard. Barren Glory, which is more or less a functional reprint of the unglued card The Cheese Stands Alone, which, itself, is a reference to the children's song The Farmer in the Dell. You know, Cheese Stands Alone. Tarmogoyf, an extremely aggressive card and quite possibly the most sought after card in the set. Awooga! And whose reminder text foretold of the impending introduction of the Planeswalker card type. And Dryad Arbor a forest land card that is also a creature. It's quite versatile, but can also cause a lot of headache. So he's bringing back the Phoenix, and swing with just those guys, yep. And so I don't think he sees the Dried Arbor here. Yep, now he's like block. Incredulously <laughs> checks out this Dried Arbor. Yeah, so this is uh, because of the art on this one compared to the one from Future Side. This, this one is less apparent that it is actually a creature. And the way Thomas played, he just put it alongside his land and it does look like a regular forest. Gabriel decided to call a judge and just explain to him that, like, I didn't, I really didn't see that this was a creature. The art is misleading. And in the end, was there anything that the folks at Wizard of the Coast learned with this Future Side experiment? What I did learn is that there is this much beloved part of magic and that Future Sight is the poster child of this and that, look, there is an audience for that material and that's a niche audience, but there, it's there. And that's something we have to keep in mind. It's something we have to respect. And, and every once in a while, I, 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 we do sneak stuff into you guys, you know, into our products, but it's a little more hidden than it is in Future Sight where it was blatant in your face. So what are your thoughts on Future Sight? Are you a fan? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. And please support Magic Untap by subscribing to the channel and, if you'd like, toss a buck in our tip jar on Patreon for more Magic the Gathering content. Thank you for watching.